and the head of the Asian Studies Department will be introducing her shortly. Before turning things over to Ancho, I'd like to announce next week's speaker. Uh, our next week's speaker for the complete luncheon will be Seth Jakovitz, Assistant Professor of uh, East Asian Studies, East Asian Literature and Culture at Yale. And he will give a talk on Ishikawa Tatsuo's Sampao. Uh, are there other events that anyone wants to announce? If not, now Ancho will give an introduction. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to introduce my learned colleague, uh, Erica Brinkley, a, a member of uh, Asian Studies Department. Um, arguably, uh, uh, Erica is the most productive scholar of a generation in early Chinese thought. In um, 2010, she produced her first book on uh, Chinese individualism. That book expands our understanding of um, individuality and person group in global terms. Her second book came out two years later. It's on um, I mean, music and cosmology. And of course, Eric is also a trained classical pianist. So that might have something to do with her uh, desire to produce this wonderful book. And then three years later, in uh, 2015, she produced yet another book, which is a study of the ancient Chinese sub on the uh, state of Yet. And um, this is actually new territory for her because she was trained essentially as a cultural intellectual historian. And her third book actually was essentially a study of ethnicity, a study of empire building. So um, that's exactly why Erica is this important scholar in her field because instead of wallowing in the ethereal, uh, <laughs> self-referential world of ideas, which I tend to do, uh, she ventures out into all sorts of territories and she wouldn't mind actually attacking very difficult problems. Her third book actually requires her to use archaeological and linguistic uh, sources of one sort or another. And of course she's a cunning linguist, fluent in Chinese, Japanese, German, she could read ancient Greek, so you know, so she can do all sorts of things that, um, you know, mortals like us cannot. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure today, in her un understated, unassuming way, she will be enlightening us on cosmogony. From a theological point of view, she will be talking about the notion of, quote unquote, a god in Taoist terms. So, without further ado, let me turn over the podium to you. Here. So much on children. Um, I don't think anyone, <laughs> any human being, could possibly live up to that um, introduction. Uh, but at the very least, uh, we'll try to have fun today. Um, and I want to thank Com Comparative Literature and uh, Asian Studies for having me here today. And this is my first time to speak in this series, and uh, it's exciting because I've often si uh, sat out there and uh, enjoyed uh, the many different kinds of speakers who were. Um, here in this room. So today we're going to be talking about a very interesting uh, excavated text. Um, it, nobody really knows how to classify these texts. Uh, a lot of people, when these, they come out, uh, these are texts basically that are uncovered in tombs, or in this particular example, uh, this is an unprovenanced text, so it might have been, uh, it was dug up by grave robbers, <laughs> uh, maybe nearby a, a really official official excavation site, and they noticed there were some other tombs around. Uh, it found its way into the black market in Hong Kong, and there was this big grab for, uh, we've got to buy these, buy these things, you know, like which, which institution is going to end up with these very, very valuable texts that go back to 300 BCE. They're basically like the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls that are giving us new insight into the religious, intellectual, cultural orientations of this period, things that were not transmitted. I mean, they just fell off the radar 
after we don't even know when they fell off the radar because these, these texts are not even listed in the official kinds of imperial library uh, archive sources. Uh, so this is really, really exciting territory. And I'm going to pre be presenting this particular view on creativity as though it were kind of a, a normal view of Taoism. But I want you to realize that actually this interpretation is somewhat based on uh, my own interpretation of this new text. And it's trying to offer something new to the discourse on uh, Taoist ideas of wu wei, which is often, they're off is often translated as non-purposive action or effortless action. If, in fact, I have a colleague uh, who's written extensively on this. Uh, he's at, um, in Vancouver, UBC, written a popular book, uh, Trying Not to Try. Um, and basically, he's, he, he's, he's done all sorts of work on this concept of wu wei. Uh, but what I would probably argue today is that this text and the way I'm interpreting it would show you that that's a co totally artificial setup, that you're, you're manufacturing a problem. <laughs> and the, the ancient Taoists would prefer that you don't even get to the point where you're trying not to try. Um, so with that um, introduction, let me begin. I'm going to be talking about an important orientation on creativity stemming from ancient East Asia that compels us to question the historical and religious foundations of our own thoughts on creativity. We all kind of know what creativity means in the contemporary American context. At its extreme, it's paired with genius to represent the pinnacle of creativity any single individual might achieve. The creative genius is anomalous, someone of exceptional talent and ability a rare occurrence in nature, a force of nature. There's a particular ethical stance in ancient China that idealizes a certain force of nature as well. But such a force certainly isn't ever limited to a single set of human beings like the genius or the sage. This stance asks that we revert back to this force as a way of expressing the good life or the best way of being and interacting with others in the world. But instead of asking us to step out of the realm of the normal in being, creating, and producing in this world, authors of this ilk wish to keep us firmly in it. They use metaphors and vocabulary that emphasize the everyday, pure joy of being and acting in such a state of mind, being one with the Tao or the path. They speak of being useless, and they emphasize wu wei, or what scholars have translated as non purposive or effortless action, freedom, and spontaneity. They're known as Taoists. Indeed, it is this glorification of the mundane that characterizes Taoist visions of the ideal. Taoist sages are depicted as butchers, carpenters, simple peasants, or poor hermits. Even what we would normally label exceptional is transformed into the mundane. And we see this through the glorification in the Zhuangzi, which is a, a very standard classical Taoist text, probably dating to around the same time that this particular text we're looking at uh, dates to. But of course, the Zhuangzi is much more extensive. This is 13 bamboo strips. Um, so, so the glorification of the, in the Zhuangzi of the following ideal types, such as the disabled or the mutilated, those who thieve for a living, raving madmen, and even beyond the human realm, primordial blobs, shadows, echoes, and giant fish that turn into enormous birds. Here's just one description of hundreds in the Zhuangzi of a typical Taoist sage. Shu, the discombobulated. Mm -hmm. Now Shu, the discombobulated, was like this. His chin was tucked into his navel. His shoulders towered over the crown of his head. His ponytail pointed toward the sky, his five internal organs were at the top of him, his thigh bones took the place of his ribs. This is a very common kind of description in the Zhuangzi. And we have to look at these descriptions to try to tell us what they're telling us about being in this world. It's not just being human, it's going beyond the human, it's somehow fitting in to this larger cosmic whole. Okay? And they're trying to, in a sense, almost glorify uh, this mundane and glorify the, the odd and bizarre. Um, and, and that's a very important point. 
uh, because it fits right into their philosophical view that I'm going to talk about. With the introduction of a new bamboo strip text that had never been transmitted in the ancient era called the Hengxie, and that's this term here. Actually, this is not working, so I can't even use the pointer, I mean the little asterisk thing, can I? You can use it. I can't? Is it here? It's the little green thing. It's the green one, right? So it's working? Oh, it's off, so let me try. Okay. Okay. So this is the, this is, these are the characters. Um, and, and we've translated into, I, I actually have a translation that I worked on with uh, some, a couple colleagues from other universities back in 2010 when we had a Penn State conference here on this text. Um, and we, we, we just wrote in a journal, basically. We like, took over a journal and, and had, had a special um, edition of it. Um, so we, we translated as the primordial state of constancy. Um, and constancy would be this hung, or this thing that's kind of unchanging. But what's important is that in this philosophy, everything changes. Um, and so the hung is this kind of um, offset, the, 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 the complementary, the thing that underlies all of this change, right? So um, we can now think about the mundanity of being one with the Tao, which we, in, this, uh, in our interpretations, usually associate with hung. And there are a lot of uh, actual associations between this term hung, constancy, and Tao in ancient China. I won't get into that because it gets really complicated. Um, but we can think about being one with the Tao in, in another way, in terms of creativity and creative change. In these early Chinese texts, uh, we have hints, or in er lots of early Chinese texts, we have hints at creator gods and other types of creation. But the primordial state of constancy provides us with the most detailed Genesis story and version of what might, one might call a Taoist creativity. This text also just happens to settle an old controversy. Oops. So just to, an aside from the materiality of these texts, here's the bamboo strips, uh, or you can call them slips, uh, each and, and this is the, the writing that they're in. So when they're published, basically you get, um, you have the facsimile versions of the actual bamboo strips, so you can always refer back to those. So you, some of them you can pick out even, like this is Xia, and this is Shan. These are, you know, this is probably, I don't know, Yue or something like that. Um, so, so you can pick out some of them if you know a little bit and you, you've been exposed to this. Uh, but for the most part, see this on the side? This is what the Chinese scholars have transcribed into kind of more recognizable, they're not actually even recognizable by most Chinese speakers. Uh, so graphs, that, and then these get kind of translated into actual Chinese graphs in the classical Chinese language, which then gets translated into our, our, our medium. So a lot of uh, trying to figure out what these things are saying. It's very, very hard. Um, when we went over this, 13, these 13 strips uh, back in 2010. Uh, it was a, a room full of uh, you know, scholars from the international community who could all read these things, and uh, we went over word by word, <laughs> and lots of debate. And, and also, you know, contemplating, are you gonna, how are we gonna rearrange these strips? Because we don't think the guys who did the first organization of the strips did it right. Okay, so in other words, whole paragraphs might follow in a totally different arrangement of the text. Okay. So this is what they would have looked, this is a newer <coughs> version, this is kind of a replica kind of uh, version, and you can see all the, the stuff that has rotted away are the, are the strings, but the bamboo strips remain. Uh, so this is, the, this is just a cheap replica version that I found on the web. <laughs> um, Anyway, back to this controversy. In the early part of the 20th century, Joseph Needham, who was the great writer and thinker from England, in fact, there's a, there's a book on him, his life. Uh, do you guys know the title of that book about Joseph Needham's life? Really popular book. Uh, he's, he's responsible for writing all of the science and civilization uh, books, in, uh, most of starting them out, and there's just these hundreds of volumes now of the science and civilization in China, all because of this, this one guy. So he's, he's also talking about Chinese philosophy because science and philosophy are somewhat related. And so he spoke of this Chinese 
predilection, predilection for self-generated creation rather than creation gods and myths. Okay, this is uh, early 20th century. Half a century later, Western um, scholars like Frederick Mote, Dirk Body, and John Wangzhi, they kind of pick up on his insights and they run with it. And in the vein of the Chinese mind is like this, <laughs> singular, <laughs> and there's one singular Chinese mind, uh, they basically discuss this so-called lack of a creation myth in, um, in early Chinese culture. Um, based, and they base their arguments um, on the so-called inner necessity or spontaneously self-generating nature of the cosmos. In other words, the cosmos was always there and it's just always creating and creating more things and things like that. These claims are 20th century scholars have since been convincingly refuted uh, by Paul Golden in, a, in an article titled The Myth That China Has No Creation Myth. And most contemporary scholars of China would uh, have a hard time not agreeing with Golden's arguments. There are creator gods. There, if you look carefully in the excavated or the transmitted texts, you see, you know, we even read one in class called Tai Yi Gives Birth to Water. Okay, so there's a creator god giving birth uh, to actual creation, right? So there are these creator gods. Um, and lots of them in the early traditions. Nonetheless, there's an, a way in which Mote, Bod, and the like were right. Certain cosmological outlooks in early China do not describe creation in terms of anthropomorphic intents or acts of will and active fashioning. Okay? Rather, creation is described according to or organic biological metaphors of self-generation, coupling, and spontaneous emerging and arising. So what I'd like to do is basically um, kind of analogize this to um, if you're talking about birth and you're thinking about these natural metaphors of birth, you're really taking away sometimes the agency of the, of the, uh, of the person involved because, uh, for example, a woman who's pregnant with a fetus, if you asked her, okay, go and create this baby, she would not know how to create that baby, right? What's happening are lots of different things coming into play, and there's a kind of an inner necessity of the, now we would call them, you know, the chromosomes and all of these things coming together to basically uh, create, create human life in, in this world. Um, and so for that reason, you know, a lot of women are like, yeah, it's just like this kind of autopilot thing, you know, it just gets started and like, I don't even know that a foot is being formed right now, you know, I don't even know what's really going on, but it's cool to read about it on the internet, you know, like at this time, this and this and this are developing, but there's this disconnect, right? It's because the agent itself is not actively fashioning. There's a different process going on, okay? So, um, Dirk Bada says the following, as you've probably read, because I've had this slide up for <laughs> forever already. Um, and he says, the Chinese cosmic pattern is self-contained and self-operating. It unfolds itself because of its own inner necessity and not because it's ordained by any external volitional power. Not surprisingly, therefore, Chinese thinkers who have expressed themselves on the subject are unanimous in rejecting the possibility that the universe may have originated through any single act of conscious creation. So while Dirk Bod was wrong in trying to encapsulate a singularly Chinese approach in, to creation, his description of the cosmic pattern here in terms of inner necessity is actually helpful in underscoring what's important about this view of cosmic creation. Okay. Natural creativity is a process of sp spontaneous creation uh, generation in which every creation, indeed every living being, seems to be uh, and function according to a logic of inner necessity. And if I had the time, I would go into a really long philosophical debate about how inner is probably not the right word because they're trying to get beyond inner and outer uh, already. And so that's why I would probably phrase it instead of inner necessity as local time-space necessity. Okay? Um, and this is getting into the realm of, I mean, if you've done studies in Buddhism and you understand the concept of no self and moving beyond a sense of any fixed identity, um, that we're always changing, and that there is nothing you can point to uh, that is eternal in this process, then I think you're getting at uh, something very similar to what's happening in this Chinese context. And who knows if there was a connection uh, with ancient Buddhism. Let's get to the text. 
Um, in the very beginning of this Genesis story, there's this cosmogony. It states, in the primordial state of constancy, there is no material existence. There is simplicity, stillness, and emptiness. And this is great simplicity. And stillness is great stillness. And how do, you, how do you define these things? How do you describe it? It's just great, right? Um, it fulfills itself without representing itself. Uh, so my husband, who's in astronomy, um, just recently came out with a, <laughs> a discovery of a particle. We think it's a really big deal. And they're calling it the super tau. <laughs> so tau being a, a Greek letter. Um, and he was describing it to me, and he's like, yeah, if, if this, is, this kind of theory is correct, it's a whole, it's a whole you know, beyond the paradigm of physics, and there's a whole slew of super symmetric particles that are kind of shadowing and echoing. You know the particles here, and I was like, "That's just like the super Tao." You know, it's like the, it's like the, it's the great emptiness. It's the, it's the super thing that's there and it's shadowing everything. Okay. Uh, so, wait, how can I? Okay. Um, and then the text, oops, the text continues uh, to talk about this very important uh, phenomenon, phenomenon of all creation happening. Bounded space arises once there is bounded space. There is chi. Once there is chi, there is material existence. Once there is material existence, there is a beginning. Once there is a beginning, there is the passage of time. Okay, this is all in the very first, like, bang. <laughs> it bangs it to you in the beginning. This is the, this is the beginning of the cosmos. Um, and what's so interesting here is that we have no formulation in the, the, uh, the traditional text of this yu zuo. Okay? Believe me, we probably spent a day talking about like what Yu was in this text, um, and nobody really knows. But the fact is, is that it is written as Huo actually, without the without the uh, the, the, the radical there. Uh, but most people thought that this notion of boundaries was really interesting, and that somehow this author thought it was important to bring boundaries to the fore of. Uh, the creation process. Because once you start to create, uh, the word space for Yu is critical, its literal meaning is boundary. Boundaries require an act of marking space, the creation of distinctions and differences, of something differentiated from undifferentiated emptiness, such as that describing the primordial state of constancy. It requires breaking free of stasis, of constancy, and the absolute. In other words, Difference in relativity appear through the emergence of boundary making as a creative cosmic process. And space and time must emerge simultaneously to make boundary making possible and even meaningful. Space, on the one hand, is necessary as a kind of field upon which material existence and everything that exists um, can be produced and differentiated. And time, on the other hand, is necessary for difference to continue to occur and providing the changes in material existence that occur from one moment to the next. Now, why did I go into such elaborate detail to talk about space and time um, and basically boundary making? It's to underscore the very fundamental process of creative change that is supposed to be intrinsic to the cosmos. And the reason why this becomes important uh, becomes clear in the second half of the text. And in almost all early Chinese texts, they're not just talking about the beginnings of the, the universe. They really don't care. <laughs> um, in, in some sense, deep sense, they don't care. They're using it as a kind of way, and a rhetorical way, actually, to talk about the here and now and how we human beings should ideally mimic this process. This, the, we, should, you know, we should somehow grasp this fundamental process uh, through our being in some way, and mimic the cosmos. And what if we do, then we are really doing the right thing. Okay, and that's that's considered to be the the good life in uh, in the Taoist world. It's their argument for authority. You know, we don't go back to the rights, and uh, we don't look to political authority for authority. We look to the cosmos and the original or, original. Uh, you know, the origination of all, everything in the world as our ultimate authority. So it's basically a religious, um, philosophical view. 
And what's so interesting is that this particular author seems to be very philosophically inclined, seems to really understand that the key to, um, to talking about this type of process is one, not of owe and telling people not to do anything, which you, if you take owe literally, it's doing nothing, right? And that is misinterpreted in so many ways and in so many contexts of, in East Asia, like laissez-faire government, doing this, just let it go, be all free and easy. Um, but it's really a very specific mode of being. And if you read most of the texts, you, you try to get at it. Uh, but the thing about the Taoists is they can't tell you exactly how to do it because it goes against their basic fundamental belief that you lose <laughs> the truth once you start talking about it. So we can all just go home at this point because <laughs> don't listen to me. I don't have the truth, right? Um, but, but this particular slide is interesting because it talks about um, how nothing, everything is self-generated. And even qi, uh, constancy, does not engender qi. And people are like, well, we thought constancy was the solution to everything. You know, if constancy is underlying everything, then how come it, it, it's, not even, it's not even producing qi, which is the fundamental unit, they thought, in ancient China of, of the cosmos. Well, my way of, of explaining that is that this person, this philosopher, wants to really emphasize this process of creativity and the, uh, the notion that there are no internal externals here. How can you have a self that's self-generating? I mean, how can you have this process go if there's no such thing, if the self is always changing? Boundaries are always being made and being destroyed. And so there is no inner necessity. There's only what's coming up through the ground in every moment of time and space in, in the kind of local sense. Okay? So chi is not being acted on or caused by, um, uh, uh, by constancy. But there's something there in this universe that we might call constancy. We're not supposed to call it anything. But we might call it constancy or Tao. And that's what's allowing it to, uh, to kind of evolve on its own. Okay? So maybe of its own accord instead of on its own. Something like that that's trying to get away from this language of the self and an eternal um, uh, identity. So we pan over to the second part of, the, of the, the, the text. And what's interesting, again, is that this is really where it's at. This is where the da ancient Taoists want to focus. They want to focus on the human world, and they want to show somehow that their depiction of the early cosmos is what we should be modeling ourselves on. Uh, so there's this intriguing statement, and really it's not, it's not given in anywhere in the rest of the tradition, traditional texts. But they, they basically give us the fall of humankind, or the fall of, <laughs> of you know, it's the, it's the eating the apple <laughs> in Eden or something like that. It's the fall. Um, so if everything's so hunky-dory in the universe, then why, why is everything not hunky-dory in our world, right? This is a big question. They say, well, they don't really answer why, but they say it's, it's, it's located in our world. We human beings are responsible somehow. And if you look at their description of what humans are doing wrong, especially in the larger corpus of Taoist texts, usually you, you come to the conclusion that it's we're trying too much to control things. So the issue is control. It's agency, it's the sense of having an identity and a, and a will and something associated with your kind of cogn cognizant, conscious sense of control. Okay? So this is a very important passage because it shows uh, the emergence of disorder from human beings. So how are we supposed to um, get out of this uh, conundrum? Uh, well, we try to look for uh, signs of heaven's, uh, uh, heaven's creativity in this world, and we try to allow that to happen through our own selves. Okay? And this is very vague, I know, and it's, it's, it's a big problem in Taoism to kind of figure out how you're supposed to act when, in fact, the fundamental theology is that they can't tell you how to act. Okay? Uh, so, regarding the endeavors of heaven, they will arise of themselves to become endeavors, and how could they not be continued? In other words, if you look at the world around us, 
everything's kind of flourishing on its own and nobody's really like interfering with that and it's doing just fine, right? Um, so they will continue. They will be, they will be fine. Um, but in the human realm, it's not so. And so we are all considered to be all under heaven. We, that's the realm that we live in. We are part of this phenomenal, uh, phenomenological world. And we are supposed to mimic this process of self-arising, or zizuo, which is the uh, way here. They have, um, they've changed the verbs. Um, and what's interesting is everybody wants to focus, um, when they study Taoism, on way. There's only one single term. But if you look at all the texts, they're switching up the terms. The verbs are all different. It's acting, it's arising, it's generating, it's producing. It's all of these things. Intriguingly, it's not destroying. They're always focusing on the creative moving forward part. Because with every act of creation, there's destruction. Because it's change. You're moving from one position to another. So they don't, you know, like in the Hindu conception, you have the god, Shiva, who is the destroyer and the creator, who, and they go together, and they're, they're kind of, one is, you know, very important. But they definitely stress destruction. And in this theology, no, they're not talking about destruction. It's really a hunky-dory, hippy-dippy type of, uh, of image of, of how nature works. Okay, so it's always production, beautiful creation. And, and this word in here, they're switching to acting instead of just arising. So um, the emphasis in this second part of the text is never on way doesn't even really, it only mentions it a couple times, but really the, uh, the link is with this, this concept of zi, having, uh, forming on its own, something, doing something of its own accord um, and acting, uh, happening of itself instead of not doing or this other formation. And the reason I like to bring this slide up is that um, I think it's, um, what it does is it, it de-emphasizes the, ac the actual agent who's doing the action. <laughs> um, uh, so I know this is a really hard thing to explain. Uh, but when you talk about Wu Wei, you're actually talking about what should you do as an individual you know, to be one with the doubt. Well, you should Wu Wei. And they're, they're, the approach there is you're already taking it out of the realm of, you're already assuming that there's an identity and a cognitive conscious uh, person, personhood is there, and, that you, and you have to try not to try, right? But if you focus on zi wei, you're focusing on the process itself. You take the agent out of the equation, and that's really what they want to get at, okay? And that's why this particular author is really, really uh, kind of offering very profound uh, uh, insights into this philosophy. And that's why I don't think it's a, it cannot be a, a, a forged text. There's no way any like peasant could have thought this kind of stuff up. Uh, it fits so exactly into uh, the tradition itself. And even in this, the second part of the text, you come to a very important, what I think is an emphasis on one's place. Okay? Uh, this is, can be seen, qi suo, is a, a way of talking about, um, in, in classical Chinese, of just, you know, you, you find your proper place, you know, it could be seen as like your pr a proper place in a hierarchy, you find a proper position, um, or something like that. But here, they're really, when they say nothing goes against its place, they're, they're basically talking about finding your proper cosmic potentiality and just living by it. Okay. And so the, the emphasis on place here is so intriguing because it goes back to, it, it kind of reminisces, uh, it forces us to reminisce about the early cosmos and boundary making and, and space time and creation. And that creation is happening in a particular time and place. It's a very localized event. It doesn't have to do with you, it has to do with the process throughout the world. Okay. So. That's my um, focus. Um, so just to conclude briefly, I end with a quote from a spokesperson uh, from the MacArthur Genius Foundation. <laughs> I call it the Genius Foundation because everybody just likes to uh, you know, 
just joke about how they, they like to just kind of designate geniuses in our society. Um, and it comes somewhat close to, uh, you know, what we think about creativity in this ancient Taoist context. Um, but it still obviously maintains a very Western Euro-American take on all this is somehow very special. Okay? Genius is a state, but creativity is an activity. It's the stuff you're doing. And I thought that was neat, that they, you know, they, yeah, activity, that's exactly what the ancient Taoists would say. Creativity is the activity, and it's just making things. It's just doing things. It's just doing it with the Tao, um, in, in, in being enlightened in that way. Um, but I, you know, and having read a lot of ancient Chinese texts, I tried to, like, uh, channel uh, an ancient Taoist, uh, the author of this of this function. I thought, oh, well, they, what, how would they respond to this? And I was like, I said, well, this is how they would say. It. This is what they would say. There is no such thing as genius, and creativity is both a state and an activity that is all around us, waiting to be recovered. If there were such thing, if there were such a thing as genius, I suppose it would be this. Everywhere and in everything. You've got to get that little uncertainty in there to, for it to be truly Taoist. Because you can never be dictatorial and prescriptive in your approach. You have to have this kind of like undermine, underlying sense of, hmm, we're just not quite sure, but we think so. And maybe it's a good idea if you, if you kind of take this suggestion. Um, and... Um, to bring us back to the question of is there a creator god in this scenario, well, I have a few responses. The first is, no. If, if, if your god functions through a divine will and a divine intent, because this is the opposite of, uh, it's trying to kind of go straight against that view, uh, that vision, that there is that kind, that type of control. Instead, it's defining a different type of control, but control with, I mean, Control is like a bad word uh, in, in, this, in this philosophy. Uh, it's not control, but it's a god and a creator god that functions through the ceaseless act of creating. Not in this kind of omniscient or ca causal or even controlling way, but in this kind of organic way that is manifesting itself in every single uh, locality, time and place. So, is there a creator God? Yes, if you define God in a certain way, and that God is you. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much uh, for listening. So we spent some time reading up on classical Chinese poetics um, and a uh, theory of classical Chinese poetics, much of which is routed through Taoism and through mm -hmm. Buddhism, as you know, yeah. Erica Brindley book too, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, through all that sort of stuff. Um, and one of the conundrums that we came up against was precisely this issue of control. So a lot of this discourse about classical Chinese poetics comes into the Anglophone tradition through like Ernest Finolosa and Ezra Pound and, and that sort of thing, right? So issues of control and, and fascism uh, are going to be there um, in those concerns. And, and a lot of it came up in our discussion um, around the term zhiran, right? Natural zhiran, yeah. zhiran, zhiran. Sorry, David. So, um, so I'm wondering if you see that term as kind of coming in through the, um, as opposed to wu wei, right? So you're not in wei, or actually gelling. And, yeah, as the main right? concepts. Yeah. So, so how does that fit in, in terms of this question of control? Because um, there's certainly something about 
the idea, I mean, this like the creator God is you question, and yet, <laughs> um, if you're if you're if it's so place dependent, if it's so locale dependent, then knowing your place in the system so that you can resonate and act without um, friction, without striving, right. or something like that, becomes very important, right. and so that becomes also very determinative. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, what, what is up with the question of control that's going on here uh, in terms of forcing people to identify with a certain space and place in society? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, they would be, they would just, like, scream if they heard you say forcing people to <laughs> identify with them. It was, like, going against everything that they, I mean, so, so the idea is, and it's true that poetics, I mean, I teach a class on uh, kind of an early, like, for undergrads, class on aesthetics and or uh, Taoism and the arts um, and basically you know this kind of stuff didn't take off in politics I mean other philosophies it just didn't work out I mean I mean you can have a theological system where maybe the ruler kind of likes this stuff but you can't really I mean it's very clear that you can't really rule a state what do you do like and, and some of these early political treatises are a little dark that way because the idea if you read even the Tao Te Ching uh, the idea is the ruler should just go off and kind of be there and this this kind of mysterious presence that's emanating, you know, this kind of spiritual virtue so that everybody can do their own thing. And it, it kind of, you know, and, and basically like they should listen to us specialists, priestly specialists. So it's almost like they want to take over the power of these, these dumb rulers. So how do we get them to, you know, exert as leap as little trouble as they can. I mean, think what's going on today. <laughs> you know, like let's just make sure our rulers are not really ruling, right? Uh, so, so I think there's a little bit of that going on in the ancient period. But the poetics, it's so interesting because Taoism really, really affects the entire like art, art visual, artistic, you know, especially the poets. They're all like. They all buy into this stuff. They're all just like, let's go and drink up a storm and write poetry and, you know, basically be one with nature and enjoy. And they're writing about nature, you know, and that oneness. Um, so, I kind of lost your question. Oh, the force. Yeah. The force. Control. 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 <laughs> it's all about control. I mean, because this whole idea of like, well, the, the ruler should just go off and be a ruler, and then everyone kind of gets slotted, right? You should just go, just find your spot, just stay in your place, right? Well, no, it's not, it's not, it's staying, um, the idea that a place is static is, first of all, really, really problematic in Taoism. Like, so, so you have butchers, but they're, and, and so the famous Cook Ding story, which, which features a butcher, is about a butcher who actually progresses along a kind of continuum of success. Like he starts out as a kind of fumbling whatever, he sees the whole ox, he's like worried about which part do I do, I don't know how to do this, and then he just keeps at it. And he keeps like, so it's, there's training involved, there's growth, there's he's sticking at you know the, what you're doing in life, um, but also then he ends up to have the kind of the spiritual map of being like the most, not just any kind of butcher, but it's just this total performative act where it's absolutely gorgeous. You know, and like anybody who can write about butchery, butchering an ox in such a beautiful way, that's a real, real feat, you know, in ancient China they do it. You know, and, and that's what these Taoists are doing, is trying to show how you can beautify the mundane through this spiritual outlook. Uh, so I'm not sure if they, you know, they're really arguing for meritocracy, or, but they do kind of believe that everybody has something to offer. Um, and so even Zhuangzi, who is like the world's biggest brain, and he loves to differentiate this and that. I mean, this is the language from the Zhuangzi, and he's into the sophistic language of the time of debate. He shows in his chapter two of his book that, yeah, you can do this, but what's it all worth? I can do the pirouettes, I can do all the technical stuff, I can beat you at it, you beat you at your own game. But let me tell you, it's totally pointless. And so in a sense, or at least I like to do it so I'm still doing it, but I, I do it lightheartedly because I know that it's, it's ultimately, like what's ultimate is somewhere else, or it's, or it's in, in the details or something like that. So I think he's still, he's still a philosopher, and he still goes for what he wants to do, um, 
but he does it with the spirit of the Tao in mind. So I don't know if that really answers. Yeah, I mean, the, your view of it was really dark. <laughs> and I'm not, I, it would actually be, I mean, you know, you could see some outside philosophers critiquing Taoism from that perspective. Like, oh, well, then what you end up doing is just having a kind of laissez-faire, deterministic uh, model. And the Taoists would just say, that's totally not what we're doing at all. In fact, you're totally going against the Tao if you do that. So that's how they would respond. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> sure, but, uh, back here. <laughs> okay. uh, in deference to my elders. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. That's very, very charming. <laughs> well, uh, I was uh, fascinated by the, I think the second or third slide you had about uh, space. Uh, we, and uh, I think you even used the phrase space time, which kind of makes sense to us. Uh, those of us can understand a little physics, but not much. Uh, but it sounds as if in that text, uh, space precedes time, right? And that time is uh, produced or follows from yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, is there is there much meditation about how space can exist without time? Yeah. So the interpreter, the my in the little footnote of my translation, I basically say this makes no sense. Okay. You know, obviously right. they want to draw out a sequence, but what they're doing is drawing out a kind of everything happens at once process, and basically when you stretch it out linguistically, you get this as a result. But what you can also read these same Chinese terms, and, and it doesn't necessarily, the yen here, yen yo shi, yen yo, and then, and then, you don't have to take it as that. It can be just like and, like a kind of like a uh, sense of, uh, you know, kind of a logical and. <laughs> uh, that, that, that you're describing something that's, that's uh, not happened sequentially in terms of time, but actually just I'm describing logically what's, what's taking place. Um, and so that, to me, as an interpreter, makes much more sense that it all happens um, at the same time. But the, the, the important point is that once bounded space arises, all of this happens. Yeah. So does that make sense? That's kind of how we interpret it. Really yeah. yeah, at that point, it's, this is more of a a logical explanation, then it really is a phenomenological explanation. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, still the same slide, Erica. I mean, I'm fascinated by what you were talking about in terms of space and time. And once there is a beginning, it says the passage, then there is the passage of time. Is there also an awareness of an ending? Uh, no. Is there, <laughs> is there also death? Or is there no death? This is, this is what's so interesting about this worldview. It's so optimistic. I mean, you know, unlike, you know, like with Buddhism, it starts with the, the, the assumption that, you know, this whole world of samsara is about suffering and there's some kind of thing that's off kilter. It's just kind of like, you got to get it. It's not right. But this world that they present is very optimistically beautiful, and if you really just tap into it, it everything really falls into place. Um, it's 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 super ideal, and that's why I meant like you know you're gonna think you're just like walked into the '60s hippy dippy kind of movement, but it's this is really you know they were preceding them by thousands of years. Uh, they they um, they had this kind of really idealistic uh, vision of of creation that. Um, that doesn't focus on death and destruction. It focuses only on the progressive movement and ends with humans here. So there's a problem, and it's humans, but we can fix that problem by reverting back to this thing that's, that basically every single one of us can, um, we can access. So it's this concept of imminence being, you know, the imminence of the divine being all over, and you just have to kind of latch into it. Uh, may the force be with you. I mean, that's basically what Star Wars is totally um, based on. You know, a, a Zen concept, Zen is, is influenced by Taoism. It's the most influenced form of Buddhism. So this, kind, this idea of the force that you can tap into and basically be the best Jedi ever. Yeah. 
Um, yes. Um, I was wondering about that analogy that you mentioned um, because of this idea that humans are essentially the problem. And you compared this to the fall of man. Now I was wondering what was before this problem? Because the idea of the fall of man is that we existed or man existed in a perfect state. And then something happened and now we don't. But it seems to me that in, in, in Taoism, is there this state before humans sort of turn bad? Or is that immediate? Humans exist and immediately there's a problem. Yeah, they don't, they don't tell us. And this is one of the more uh, fleshed out versions of a Genesis story that we get in these Taoist texts. I mean, mostly in the, in the Lao Tzu, it's just nothing creates something, and something creates one, and one creates two, and two creates three, and then there you go. It's proliferation um, at that point. Um, and in this text, it does talk about, like, once this whole process is started, it's just proliferation, and things are re reproducing themselves. Uh, Kind of. So the idea is that humans came onto the stage pretty quickly with the creation of heaven and earth. And inherently problematic. Inherently, as soon as, as, um, yeah, as they as don't it, tell. They don't say. It just jumps from you know the cosmos, the vision of the cosmos, to what we should be doing, and, and descriptions of how we should be acting. You know. So if we should be doing something, there is a teleological component to it. Um. What? You mean there was a moment where... Well, you know, if, if, if there is this idea of this is how it all started, this is what went wrong, now we should do something, that would you know, lead you to conclude there is a sort of goal that we're working toward. Oh, absolutely. This is very much a goal, but they don't want to talk about it as a goal. Because as soon as you talk about it as a goal, I mean, if you read Lao Tzu 1, the very first statement is the Tao that can be talked about is not the true Tao. Okay? So oh. this is not something that you can teach through language. Language is extremely problematic. And even in this text, they talk a lot about names, which is basically a, a way of talking about language. Uh, so how names fit and correspond to reality. So how, how can we get language to correspond and, and, and reflect this thing out there? Um, so they're really into this discourse on language, too. And they, they reject it. They, they, so, so the idea is that you um, somehow language and our facility with language is there's something wrong there, something like uh, spoiled <laughs> about it um, and so therefore you can experience the Tao but you can't necessarily if you start to talk about it then you're delimiting it you're putting uh, limits on something that's um, that's not mm -hmm. limited and it's always changing. So how can you talk about it, really? Um, you're, using, you're using the term Taoist to describe these, these texts. Uh, but the, the school of Taoism, uh, uh, when can, uh, my understanding is that this is mostly a Han Dynasty term, so about 300 years later. But, uh, Oh, absolutely. It's very problematic. Uh, but uh, 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 <laughs> there, seems to, there seems to be a recognizable group of texts. Uh, 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 you mentioned the Taishan Shui. Uh, 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 can you tell us a little, little bit more uh, how these, these ta uh, the, the Hansian that you, you've discussed, yeah. uh, it seems to be one example of a larger group. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the other texts? And, uh, what is the, the general character of these proto-Daoists? Absolutely, um, and you're totally right uh, to say that there is no concept of Taoism in this time. In fact, whether Zhuangzi had even consulted or even known about this other so-called classic of Taoism called the Tao Te Ching or the Lao Tzu is arguable. The language he uses is very different. Maybe in the outer chapter, what we call the later chapters of the Zhuangzi, you might see a sense uh, that these people who are writing are conscious of that particular group <laughs> that's thinking in that manner and they're incorporating certain kinds of language. But uh, my sense is that, and, and so, you know, back when I was a grad student, I was like, we should do a conference on, you know, what is, is Taoism even appropriate, blah, blah, blah. And I've kind of gotten over that now, <laughs> like 20, 30 years later, 20 years later. It's just like, you know, there's something that we can hermeneutically and interpretively, there were these groups. 
And we don't exactly know how they manifested themselves in that society. Like, you know, were they a tight-knit kind of uh, cult-like uh, group, that, like the Moists, who got together and they had a head at the very top uh, who uh, told them what to do and they had to kind of follow that um, and go out and fight for a lord that they've, they've, you know, sworn fealty to. Were they like that, or were, was this more of a kind of general religious phenomenon, maybe in a different location in, in China, maybe maybe the South? A lot of people are throwing that idea around that maybe these are, these are it's a totally relig different religious paradigm than what we know from the Northern Plains, uh, kind of more uh, Zhou Dynasty stuff. So maybe what we're seeing is a clash of religious cultures here. Um, and that they're picking up and drawing on local types of religions and orientations, and then finally it's gelling a little bit later on or something like that. But it does seem like this, these are very well-developed uh, traditions of uh, religious practice and thought, and that's what's so interesting. We just don't have a, a, a group that we can associate that with, like an actual community that we can talk about. We don't know. Some of the texts talk about, I mean, they're, you know, they're not talking about the, uh, the Taoists as a group. They talk about these thinkers, individual leaders who had kind of people who followed them, maybe, and, and talked with them, and their own disciples. But they don't talk about these as, like, institutional groups. Obviously, it's, it's a different kind of institution when you're talking about master-disciple. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say right now. We, we don't know a lot about it. <laughs> I have a controversial question. When, when this thing first came out, I read it with some friends. Yeah. We thought it was, it was a fake document. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, it, yeah, I mean it, I, it, you never know. Are there still some debates about that question? Because, I mean, I, I think this text is way too simple. Um, well, you know, you're looking at it from, you know, that's so interesting. Because you're looking at it from the perspective of, is it simple because you've done all of this kind of reading in this later exactly. tradition, right? right? Does it fit into, for your, from your perspective? I guess what I'm saying is that there is a feeling, to me anyway, there's a to the fact construction of this thing. But I, I, I'm not yeah. saying you have to feel yeah. the way I do. I'm just, no. I'm not so sure that it is a real thing. So, well, if you look at, you issues. should look at the strips. I mean, they're yeah. really, I mean, some of those characters, how do you even make those? Like, nobody knows how to even, like, interpret mm -hmm. half the characters in there. Um, and so, and also the way it fits into um, just kind of pre-existing stuff in the early Chinese tradition, but it has a slightly different approach that nobody really talks about, and it never takes off in later traditions. Way. I mean, this idea, yes, but not all of these other, you know, you would think that it would be more dogmatic if it were a later text. They would, they would be kind of following this, but this is so fresh and so amazingly like. So that's why I would argue that. But I also think that, you know, now it's just generally recognized that the Shanghai Museum strips are all authentic, and that this guy in Taiwan who was just about to buy them, and he, then he got scared, and he got cold feet at the last minute and just didn't, because he, he lost out. I mean, it could have been in Taiwan, but the Chinese got it, so they got this whole cash. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Along those lines, are there pretty radical techniques now that could be used, as has been the case with some medieval Western manuscripts, do they keep ink? And in ways of that sort, some of them used to mention earlier the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, to make visible little bits they were not otherwise visible. And some of them come out of very, very different academic disciplines. Yeah. Um, my, my sense is I haven't heard any arguments about the, the, the dating of the ink, which I think would be really. Uh, and it's not just ink. I mean, it's like the sure, it's 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 carbon. Sense, There's yeah. carbon in there. Exactly. Could you do a carbon like, fourteen? Yeah, exactly. Why? Why are they supposedly they have done those things? Yeah. Uh, but if anyone can fake it, the Chinese can. <laughs> yeah. Speaking yeah. of Chinese, Chinese are great. So, what have. <laughs> so, so, so this is the thing. They have lots of fakes, and so apparently there are these guys in Zhejiang who 
they write on their, their Judge Young's the text and they, they talk about them and everybody's just like, oh, that's sweet, but they're all fake. You know, and everybody, the community understands. Those are the fake ones and they can even tell that like, you know what they're saying is really dumb. Like the, the strips are actually yeah. really, yeah, really they are. There are some too, dumb stuff. Yes. too easy in the sense of right. even the characters. Right. These, right. Are, right. These, are, these are very difficult characters. That comes out in modern Chinese as easy. But actually, it, the ancient stuff is really, really complicated. We have no idea what half of this stuff is. Um, and so, um, so yeah. And then they also discovered like this way of like there would be strips of these band where they sort of do the measurements. But then apparently they would bind them in some way, like keep them together, and or they would I forget exactly what it was. But there's a way of like actually seeing that this was together in a certain order and they were bundled together in this and there's like a, a remaining shadow or something as to where this occurred. It, it's really, it's actually beyond my uh, expertise. Uh, but there is a culture and scholarship on the materiality of these texts that are constantly trying to figure them out that way. They're trying. They're trying. <laughs> it's hard because... Um, They're purposefully trying. As we know in, in the field, the ancient Chinese, they buried everything. So there's a ton of stuff that, I mean, as much as, as being, is being recovered, at the same time it's all being destroyed. Because they're building, you know, highways and things just right over this. It's just all, it's all, like, you go to the ground in China, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm stepping on, like, tons of artifacts and amazing things. Because they buried it all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much.